Hello there, everybody. <laughs> My name is Stephen Goldfarb. I'm a particle physicist at the Atlas Experiment at CERN, and here is my comrade, Mohammed. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Faroub, and I am an Atlas physicist. Uh, I work with the physics analysis in Atlas Experiment. So we're going to give you a little bit of a visit today. We're going to take you around, show you a bit of the detector. First of all, just so you know, we're at CERN, which is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, located in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we're just sort of on the border, so we're almost in France, mainly in Switzerland here at Atlas. And this is a laboratory which is unique in all of the world. It's full of thousands and thousands of physicists who come from every place around the planet. Where do you come from, Bob? So I am Palestinian. Uh, I work for Oklahoma University in the U.S., but uh, I am based at CERN since uh, 2010. Uh, I have a PhD in particle physics from Bonn University, Germany, and diploma in theoretical physics from Italy. So I traveled around uh, Europe. A little bit, yeah. yeah. This is very typical uh, for physicists here. I myself came from the U.S., worked for American institutes, worked for the Swiss Institute, and I currently work for the University of Melbourne as well. I live in France, and I work over here in Switzerland. It's very common. We have people from everywhere, and the diversity of the people who work on these experiments are extremely important that we have very good science because of that. Uh, around here, around this laboratory, there are people working on a whole variety of different experiments, different accelerators. Uh, all of us are trying to understand the basic building blocks of nature. We're trying to understand what we call the elementary particles. That's our entire goal. What are the elementary particles and how, what are the rules that rule their, their interactions. How do they interact with each other? What are those rules that make that up? That's what we call particle physics. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's unique about Atlas and where we're looking? So we have the LUC, the largest accelerator ever built, 27 kilometers in circumference. And we use it to accelerate uh, protons most of the time. We can achieve almost the speed of light. And we are interested in the energy carried by the, the fast protons mm -hmm. because when we collide them, their energy can be converted into mass, E equal mc squared. So when we collide protons, we can create new particles, and our job is to detect the new particles, measure the production rate, the decay modes, because that helps us to understand the basic structure of matter, and of course the fundamental interactions in nature. Now at the LUC, we have, we collide protons in four places. One of them is Atlas, so we shoot the protons at each other, we smash protons, and when, when we create new particles, we need to detect them. So Atlas detector, too, because it's a machine that detects the outcoming of the proton-proton collisions. Mm -hmm. It's, in principle, it's a, a gigantic camera. It's huge. It's 50 meters long. And as you see, it's 27 kilometers in, uh, in diameter. It's very heavy, 7,000 tons, equal to the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Mm -hmm. But it's made from electronics. Different sub detectors, different machines. Mm -hmm. Each sub detector detects different physics quantity or detects different types of particles. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're at one far end of the detector. Uh, this is the end that, that's perhaps known most to everybody. If you come to visit, you get to see this end of the detector, the outer part of our detector, and of the other detectors uh, on the Large Hadron Collider are detectors made to look for muons and to measure the velocity of muons because they make it all the way through from the inside. Inside, where we unfortunately can't take you today, there's many other detectors, right? There's the calorimetry, which stops everything except for the muons from getting out to here. And inside from that, there's the inner detector where we have several different systems designed to measure the charge tracks. So, that yes, the collision occurs uh, there, so 25 meters away from from where we are here. So that, that blue that everyone sees up there, this is shielding surrounding the accelerator. The, muon, the, the, the protons go in through in one direction and they're circulating clockwise and counterclockwise, so they come in the other direction as well, and they pass right through each other in the center. In fact, what's interesting is that it's not so easy to do. It's one of the questions we got on Instagram is how do we get such small particles to collide? It's really, really hard. Uh, the beam is not continuous. It comes actually in little bunches, we call them. A little bunch is 100 billion. Right? So 100 billion, is, that's like the number of stars in a galaxy. So we have 100 billion going through 100 billion 
every 25 nanoseconds, 40 million times a second, when we have 100 billion going through 100 billion in the center of this detector, we get maybe 60 that collide, 60. So it takes a lot of work to get these tiny particles to actually collide. And by collide, we mean that they pass through each other and what they're composed of, the quarks and the gluons that make up the protons, interact. So we try to see those interactions and to capture them with all of these detectors. So why don't you tell us a little bit more, Mohammed, about how we go about doing this with these detectors. And I'm going to start looking for good questions on it. So we can start from the innermost part of the detector. We have a tracking system to track the charged particles. So it's in the middle. And sometimes we actually we call it the inner detector because it's very deep inside Atlas. So when we collide the protons, sometimes we produce uh, protons, charged particles, electrons, and muons, and we need to measure their charges and their uh, momentum. Mm -hmm. So they traverse the tracking detector, and we know the position. And we can build the tracks, and since we have strong magnets, charged particles, when they travel through the magnetic field, they bend right or left, depending oh, okay. on the electric charge. So we know the electric charge, and from the curvature, we can measure the momentum. Okay, so if you're going to build one of these at home, you know this one concept, right? That's a magnetic charged field magnetic field. And moving electric charge, uh, uh, charged particle. So a charged particle will curve in the magnetic field. It curves one way, you know it's positive, and the other way it's negative. How much it curves tells you its energy. The more it curves, uh, then the less its energy, much like in a race course, right? So you go to watch the, the, the Monaco Grand Prix, uh, you'll see that the car is much more, much slower, right? Because they have to curve. You lose energy as you pass a curve. If you watch the Indianapolis 500, one of these big race tracks, then they can go uh, much faster, in a faster race track. And that's why the Large Hadron Collider is so large. So, yeah, so the tracking system also built from three tracking sub-detectors. The mm -hmm. innermost part, we call it the pixel detector, like the digital camera. Uh -huh. So we have 92 megapixels. And uh, organized in concentric shells because we need to cover the full solid angle so no particles can escape the detection. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Then we have uh, the semiconductor tracker. It's made from silicon but long strips. Uh -huh. Then we have the TRP, transition radiation tracker. Very simple, very old technology, but it's made from straws. It's from straws with wires in the which I mean, it's something kind of similar to it out here. Similar to the immune spectrometer, but mm -hmm. smaller mm -hmm. straws, and we have an extra phenomena called the transition radiation effect. Mm -hmm. But it's a tracking. I mean, when exactly. the charged particles go through the gas, for example, yeah. they ionize the gas, and the free electrons will be collected by a thin wire inside the straws. And since we know the position of the straws, the strips, the pixels, we can guess the trajectory of the charged particle. Very good. Um, we have some really good questions that have already popped up. We have some that came in uh, early on Instagram, uh, and they're excellent questions. One is what it's by me, Nahi Batanga. What will you get by knowing how the early universe looked like? So that's a really good question. We we try to look at the early universe um, because there's a basic rule in 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 particle physics, and that's that more massive particles can transform instantly to less massive particles plus energy, right? What Muhammad was saying, mc squared can become e, right? So that if you're more massive, you can transform to something less massive plus energy. So the most massive particles are the ones that disappeared at the beginning of time. In the first second, they were all gone. They were all gone. So in order for us to study them and to understand them, we need to reproduce them. So we do this here by adding energy to the lightest particles. The lightest particles we have, the things that are stable, up quarks and down quarks and electrons, which make up atoms, basically. That's what you need to make build atoms. Um, they're the lightest of all the particles, and so they're stable. If you take them and you accelerate them, if you add energy to them, then when they interact, you can produce the more massive particles, and that's a way that we're sort of exploring the beginning of time. Now, what will this get humanity? 
we don't always know. This is ex pure exploration. It will teach us about what our universe is made of. And the, the information you get from that is tremendously valuable. That allows us to build new tools for the future, allows us to make new technologies, uh, and, and it teaches future generations, gives them tools they need to go forward, solve the problems that they're gonna have. So uh, along the way, of course, there's many things we've invented, but what's important is we're just trying to understand mother nature that's what we're doing here um i'll look for some more questions okay so uh, steve we mentioned the tracking system we have also calorie meters to measure the energy of the produced particles mm -hmm. we have two calorie meters after the tracking system the first one is called the electromagnetic calorie meter which helps us to measure the energy of the electrons positrons the antimatter of electrons and photons and also we have another calorie meter we call it hadronic calorie meter because it helps us to measure the energy of hadrons hadrons in general are composite particles made from the quarks and the gluons so remember large hadron collider because mm -hmm. we accelerate hadrons so we have hadronic calorie meter so like protons like neutrons and if we measure momenta using a tracking system and energies using uh, calorie meters we can identify particles because we can calculate masses and we can know this is a photon, this is an electron or positron or a proton or other particles. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the last atlas sub detector is the muon spectrometer because muons are the only detectable particles that can penetrate the calorimeters and, and arrive uh, yeah. the last, last, last sub detector. Muons are very interesting because that's one of the reasons we know about doing particle physics. Muons have been coming down, hitting us in the head while we've been speaking here, and you too, you can't avoid them. They come from what seems like outer space. Uh, Mother Nature likes to do collisions on her own. Uh, our sun shoots out charged particles, protons, all the time. They hit our upper atmosphere like it's a target. And when they hit the upper atmosphere, they make interactions. And sometimes those interactions are much higher energy than what we get here. But they can produce new particles, and those particles can transform into new ones. And so we get them coming down through us more than one a second uh, at a high enough energy are, are, are coming through us. So that's what makes it very interesting. That's how we learned that we could try doing this ourselves. Uh, while Mother Nature is doing this, we do build detectors and we have in the past learned about the particles that exist by having what we call cosmic ray detectors, detectors that can, that can measure. Now, one of the questions we got here on the YouTube, interestingly, just as a follow-up, because you reproduce I think mean, the question was, are we reproducing uh, the beginning of time? In a sense, we reproduce the kind of conditions. Now, what's important to understand is the big difference between energy and energy density. Okay? You'll have a quiz on this when we're done. So, the energy, the amount of energy at the beginning of time, the Big Bang, is out there all over the universe. It's everywhere. It's a huge amount of energy. When we say we try to reproduce what happened just after the Big Bang, we talk about the conditions, the energy density. So we take a bunch of energy, we put it into a beam, very, very fine beam, and when they collide, then the energy divided by the unit area where they collide gives us the energy density, and it creates the conditions that are similar to being of time, and that's where different particles were produced. And that's how we can reproduce new particles such as the Higgs boson, which is a major discovery that we made here more than 10 years ago. We forgot to describe one part of the detector, okay. the magnetic system. Oh, yeah. So we have uh, a solenoid magnet envelops the tracking system. It's very strong. It uh, can produce more than 20,000 times stronger than the Earth magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And also we have toroid magnetic system. So we have eight central to uh, toroid magnets and two in cap toroid magnets. Mm -hmm. And remember, there is a T in atoms. It's a toroidal LHC operator. It's oh, named yeah. after the toroid magnets. It's, it's interesting because that's true for all the experiments somewhat. The muon system and the magnets used to bend it. So our, our colleagues over at CMS across the way are the compact muon solenoid just to differentiate the different types of magnets. We have toroid systems. magnets. And we have toroid And magnets. since we have, uh, we need to detect, or to detect very fast particles or measure their momentum, 
we need extremely strong magnets. Yeah. So the solenoid magnet can produce two Tesla. The toroid magnets, each one of the eight central toroid magnets can produce up to four Tesla. Mm -hmm. More than 40,000 mm -hmm. times stronger than the earth magnet yeah. field. And they are electrical magnets. And since we have limited bud material budget, we cannot build big uh, magnets because they will interfere with the measurement. And mm -hmm. also the operational cost will be very, um, very high. So we have to use superconducting cables. Okay. Our magnets are extremely cold, maybe around 4.5 Kelvin or minus 268 degree below the zero. That's so cold. very cold. Yeah. So at the collision point, we have, let's say, the extremely hot, it can be trillion uh, degrees hot, but to detect the particles, we have extremely cold magnets. Mm -hmm. So we were just asked, in fact, um, uh by let's see how, but how how large are the magnets you can't even see them here right they're they're hidden back there behind this big wheel they're they're very very large <laughs> is one answer to that so uh it's from from muhammad to the anti-muhammad on the other side i assume there's an anti-muhammad 25 there. meters each to road so something like 25 it's like 25 so from inside there they go back uh and the coils are enormous coils and so maybe we can get a sneak peek if we take a look back there um so we also were asked uh, oh by the way you got a thank you from harriet for for doing a visit uh you brought uh, her students here we do lots of visits here so if there's anybody who's interested in coming to see uh the detector or the experiment uh, in person uh they should look into doing that if you come to CERN now, this is it. Uh, tomorrow is the last day that we have any access underground. But there's a lot of things to do above ground as well. And we're going to have a whole new center opening up in the fall that you'll be able to visit called the Science Gateway. So there's a lot of things to do if you were to come over to CERN to visit. In addition, Mohammed runs a wonderful program called the Virtual Visit Program. And we come around here and we will talk to anybody, just like we're doing right now, and answer questions. Uh, we won't be underground, we'll be above ground uh, while there are collisions going on, but we will still be able to answer lots and lots of questions. And we're going to try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. And one of them, okay, I'll, say, I'll get this one to you. Um, what's the most interesting experiment running right now? Me? I mean, in Atlas, we collide the protons all the time and we collect data. And every Atlas physicist has the right to look for any particle he or she wants. Yeah. And personally, I'm interested in top quark and W bosons. So those are interesting for me. Yeah. Others are interested in exotic yeah. models in Higgs uh, boson, maybe dark matter particles or sure. supersymmetric particles. Or there are people looking for the unknown, like model independent analyses. Mm -hmm. They don't have a model in mind, but they have the data. And they are looking for outliers. They can search for outliers. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing to know. While we call all of this the Atlas experiment, in fact, an experiment is each time the proton collides with another proton. Those are experiments. So we have many, many experiments going on, just an Atlas. Now, in addition to that, there are other uh, accelerators and other experiments going on. On the LHC, the large Hadron Collider, by the way, that was one of the questions. What does LHC stand for? It's not the Lausanne Hockey Club. It's the Large Hadron Collider. Um, on this, if you want to walk down the direction of the uh, accelerator there, of that tube, you would end up at an experiment called LHCB. Uh, there are another beautiful experiment uh, and that is designed to measure particles in collisions here uh, on the LHC. But they specifically like to look at particles which contain uh, the B core. That's their name, LHCB. And they look for many other things as well. They've had some wonderful discoveries of different types of configurations of quarks, pentaquarks, tetraquarks. We've also seen that. So is CMS. Um, if you were to go the other direction, uh, you would find our friends over at ALICE. Their experiment's a bit different than ours because they focus on the collisions of heavy ions. We don't call it the Large Proton Collider, we call it the Large Hadron Collider because sometimes instead of protons, we collide heavy ions. 
When you do that, you create a very interesting environment. You create the environment which existed a microsecond after the Big Bang. And I'm not saying that out of experience. I'm not that old. But a microsecond after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, uh, there was this quark gluon plasma. You know, what they sing about at the beginning of the song for Big Bang Theory, this soup of quarks and, and gluons. And um, this environment was so hot and dense that protons had not yet been formed. And so their experiment over at ALICE is designed specifically to focus on looking at those types of collisions. We also look at those here on ATLAS and across the way is CMS. CMS looks completely different to ATLAS, yet it's very similar in many ways. We both have about 3,000 authors. We both have about five, 6,000 people who work on the experiments in total. And we both publish more than 1,000 uh, papers each, findings in, in, in physics. Uh, yet we're completely independent from each other. So we're, we're gonna take a tour. We're gonna take a tour. Katarina is our camera person today and producer, director, the person coordinating absolutely everything. We wanna take you upstairs so you can see a little bit more of the experiment. By the way, um, in, you wanted to walk around here? I'll go upstairs, go upstairs. Um, I mentioned just the experiments on the LHC. There's a lot of other really cool physics going on here at CERN. Uh, there's a whole dedicated area to look at antimatter. Uh, there's an anti-proton decelerator. They actually produce anti-protons and then cool them down to the point that they can study them. They can produce anti-hydrogen to try to see if anti-hydrogen is different than hydrogen in any way other than its charge. Can we go up more? We're going up more. She's making us walk. It's good to get our steps in. Okay. Um, and, uh, and there's also a whole dedicated experiments um, to... To, to produce ions, which which can and which can be studied, um, uh, so the ISO the isotopes. Uh, ISO the facility. Yeah, ISO the ISO the facility to study isotopes, which can be useful for medical purposes. In fact, you should know that the vast majority of accelerators now in the world are at medical complexes because you can use them uh, to do imagery and also to treat. So let's 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 go down here. I, I, maybe I can show off something though while we're here, um, because we're here, because we're here. I just want to show something, okay? Because there's going to be a quiz at the end, and I want everyone to do really well. Muhammad mentioned charged particles curving the magnetic field. The other thing that we use, he also mentioned ionization, right? So ionization is what happens in these tubes. These tubes are muon tubes. Uh, inside each tube, there's gas. So you can see there's, there's both. Uh, lots of copper tubing here designed to put gas inside all of these tubes. And there's also a wire down the middle, which we put at a positive voltage. So when a particle goes through there, it ionizes the gas, and the free electrons go to that wire. And inside here, there's electronics that we can use uh, to read out. So that's how we know that a particle went through here. Okay, so you've written down the notes, ionization, charged particle in a magnetic field. You can now build your own detector at home. You have everything that you need to do that. Go for a walk. Go and go up, over. Oh, we can go through here. Let's go through here. We can take a peek out from here. We're under the LHC here. We're taking everybody under the LHC, which is just up there. I think we should go through and take a look from here. It might get noisy, in which case we have to go up above, but I think it's a pretty cool place to be. And I'll look at more questions. I'm going to look at questions. Uh huh. Okay. You talk, and I'm going to look. I'm going to find good questions. Tell them what you're looking at here. Okay, so maybe I speak about the detector and how we built it. It's a huge detector, as I said, it's 50 meters long by 25 meters in diameter, and it was assembled underground. And to lower the parts, we used two shafts. There is a shaft over there, it's around 19 meters in diameter. This is side A. On side C, we have another shaft, 13 meters in diameter. So we used the cranes to lower the parts, and we assembled the detector. 
and it took long, long time, six, seven years. And you see, still we have scaffolds everywhere, and I mean, these last week, I mean, they cleaned up the cavern mm -hmm. because when we run the detector and we have strong magnets, we should not keep any ferromagnetic material because they are dangerous yeah. for the detector. They can fly around like bullets and yeah. cause damage in the magnets or the subsystems. I spent a whole half a day in the middle there on my hands and knees with a vacuum cleaner on my back cleaning up. I found some muons that were still left over, hadn't made it out to the detector yet, cleaned them all up. I'm just kidding, muons don't live that long. Uh, we have a lot of really good questions here which we should try to answer. Uh, maybe you'd like to explain the Higgs boson and why that was such an important discovery because there's a lot of questions on here about the Higgs boson. Okay, so it's a long story. When physicists developed the standard model uh, of particle physics, so they quantized a special reality, uh, sorry, they put together special relativity and the quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and they wanted to describe the world of particle physics. And we know we have uh, uh, heavy bosons, like W and Z bosons. Those are known to be heavy from beta decays. And bosons carry forces, uh, right? Force carriers of the weak interaction. Now, when they build the theory, and quantum mechanics means probabilities. They have to calculate the probabilities. Mm -hmm. And they ended with infinities. So that's a problem. So physicists... You can't do a calculation when there's infinity. So. They, try, they try to pin down the problem, and they discover the problem is the mass of the bosons. So they to get rid of the problem, they must assume they are massless. But that's not the truth. They have mass and much, much more mass than the proton. Mm -hmm. So there was long, long discussion and many papers published, but Peter Higgs and uh, uh, Franz Weingler and others said, maybe we can assume they are massless, but they can recover their mass by interacting with a scalar particle. Mm -hmm. A scalar particle means a particle with uh, no spin. Uh -huh. So we assume they are massless, uh, so, uh, massless but through massless. the interaction, they gain their mass. Okay. So the theory becomes very beautiful. I mean, it's self-consistent it and survived all the falsification tests, uh -huh. except the stored corner of the theory, the, the Higgs boson. Yeah which was not discovered because, I mean, it took them 60 years to discover it because it's heavy. It's actually, it's not so long. Uh, they, they need... We're talking about 13.8 billion years of the universe. It took us some time to find it. So they need a huge amount of energy and mass to produce it. And also, it doesn't couple uh, strongly with the light quarks. So that's challenge. the reason why it took so much and time. We had no idea where to look. We didn't know what its mass was. You couldn't predict what its mass would be. It's very interesting because we understand how matter, how you and I, we have mass because of lunch, but because that puts energy in us. And so molecules have binding energy, atoms have binding energy that gives them a mass. Even a proton is made up of quarks, but most of its mass is the binding energy that's holding them together. It's not the mass of the quarks, which is very, very light. And so the big question is, how is an elementary particle, something which has no structure, no volume, it's not made up of anything else, and that's what we're studying here, elementary particles. How could they have a mass? And what you're saying, and what, they, what we found is that those particles interact with this scalar uniform field that's absolutely everywhere in the universe, and the amount they interact with the field is their mass. Much like a charge, the more charge you have, the more you interact with the magnetic field, the more mass you have, the more you interact with this Higgs field, and it gives you mass. So it was a, it was a huge discovery. It validated a brilliant uh, theory, which in fact was written on only a page or two of paper. It was just a very simple idea that came from another field, solid state, I think, was, was where the first idea of this sort of symmetry yeah, bridge. This spontaneous symmetry bridge. Yeah. yeah. From it's, it's, solid state. It's amazing because it, it, these stories happen all the time. Many times the theories don't pan out, they're wrong. And there's many dead ends we go down. That's what research is all about. We explored many different ranges of energy and found nothing. But finally, when we got to the right energy, we found something. And, and, and it's always going to be like that. We don't know what we're going to find next. One of the questions that was on here uh, via Instagram uh, was asking that, what's our next plan? We, we, our plan is to explore. 
to look at everything, everything we possibly can. And to measure the theory, this his standard model now that's complete with the Higgs boson, as precisely as possible. Because when you measure something as precise as possible, you're liable to find something that disagrees with nature. And and then then you have a clue of where to look for next. Right now, it's such an incredible model. It's working perfectly. Everything we measure to better and better precision matches with the model. But we have huge questions still that are not answered by nature. What are some of the questions that, that we have? There are many open questions in physics, like how many quarks how many electrons we have. Now, currently, we know that we have six quarks and six electrons. Mm -hmm. The question, do we have more? And if not, why? According to the theory, not, according to standard model, uh, nothing prevents nature from having eight or ten quarks. How mm -hmm. many fundamental interactions? We know for gravity, strong, weak, electromagnetism. Do we have fifth, sixth interactions? Or not? And if not, why? Are the four interactions a manifestation of more fundamental interaction? Or they are really separate, don't talk to each other? Mm -hmm. How many dimensions? We know that we have three special uh, dimensions plus the time. Do we have more? Uh, most of the universes, as you know, dark matter and dark energy. So what we know, what we study is four or five percent of the universe. What is the nature of dark matter? What is the dark energy? What is the it's difference between our, matter and antimatter? We should not actually be here. Yeah. Because the antimatter disappeared and we have current, we, according to the laws of physics, we know we have perfect uh, symmetry between matter and antimatter. So if antimatter disappeared, also we why, should disappear. Why are we here? So so, these are questions that human beings have been asking since the beginning of time. Right? Where, where do we come from? What are we made of? And where are we going? You want to go upstairs a little bit more, or is this okay? Can Maybe you can go to side C. Um, not sure. Maybe we can, yeah. <coughs> Let's take everybody on a walk to our detector. It's going to get loud in here. We're going to be able to explain much, but we're going to walk through so you can see the detector. You get an idea how long it is. Very, very enormous detector. The largest one ever constructed uh, for a collider. And what always amazes me is all the cables, all the services you need, the electronics, the tubing, uh, just to bring gases and things to the detector. And here we are on the other side. So we, we have we have lots of good questions. Actually, there was a question about using muons um, to look at structures on the planet, and that's true. You can do that. Muon muonoscopy. Okay, switching. We're going to switch here. Our camera person's in charge. But so so there is this possibility of taking, and uh, I, I think they've done this with the pyramids in Giza, right? They they. You, you have muons going through all the time. If you can put detectors underneath, you can actually see what the structures, if there's any hidden rooms or things like this. It takes a lot of muons, a lot of time, but you can get a high resolution image. And my understanding is that this is also being used for security and borders and things like this. You can, you can use muons to sort of probe through that and things like that. So that, that was a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, for, uh, for C. Um, Oh, this is an interesting question from, from Corto Maltese, which is, what does it mean that the theory is beautiful? That's a very nice philosophical question. Beautiful when it describes nature very well, and it, it is not so complicated, and it's self-consistent. Right. No, I mean, it can contradict others, other theories, but all the equations, all the mathematical terms, don't lead to contradictory uh, results. Yes, I, I think that's really, really important to understand. Because these days, now that we have all these means to communicate, and, and that, thanks to our friends at CERN, we invented this thing called the World Wide Web. It, it's it's great on one side. On the other side, it's, it's not just a tool for information, but for a lot of misinformation. So one should be careful. There's a lot of people who are out there who will say, I have a theory 
these are these are words that always make us shiver as physicists. I have a theory. For us, we mean something very specific. A theory is a mathematical model that can describe everything, not necessarily describe everything, but which is consistent with what we're measuring. So there's no inconsistencies. There's nothing in there that disagrees with what we are able to measure. And it's useful if it gives us a prediction, right? It, gives, it tells us you can find, and that's why our model, we find it beautiful. The standard model can be written on a t-shirt, should have worn the t-shirt, I've been written on a t-shirt, and yet uh, it tells us, excuse me, it tells us the probabilities of finding different particles. When we have an interaction, what is the probability we're going to see four muons or a couple jets or some missing energy or things like that. Limited this. number of parameters. Right. A limited number of parameters, and it, and it, and it predicts so much, and it has predicted amazingly, like things like the top quark, and this happened in our lifetime, the, 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 the most massive uh, elementary particle that we know of, we, we already knew what its mass was going to be. We knew all of its properties, its charge, everything about it before we found it. And that was only a couple of decades ago. Uh, the Higgs boson, we didn't know what its mass would be. Yet its prediction was pretty solid, so much so that it was in our theory. We were wearing the t-shirts where two lines of the t-shirt included the existence of the Higgs field. That's a beautiful theory. And the, its ability to make predictions is great. Yet, we aren't happy with that because, as Muhammad said, it, it's not giving us answers to many things. One, uh, gravity isn't in there. We don't understand gravity at a microscopic level. We don't. We have never found graviton, so we don't understand it. Uh, the imbalance between matter and antimatter, missing dark matter. But dark matter is no small thing, right? If 85% of matter in the universe is dark matter, it's what makes our galaxies spin the way they do. And we have maps, maps of dark matter, thanks to our colleagues in astronomy. We can measure that, and yet we have no clue what it is. And finally, this dark energy. The expand, we found out that our universe is expanding by looking at the frequency, the wavelengths of, of light uh, coming from distant galaxies or distant clusters of galaxies or supernovae. Uh, we know that our, our, our universe is expanding at a faster and faster pace. And yet, we can't explain that. We have to add up everything that's out there and do a calculation. And then you can say that we're missing this amount of energy. That energy comes out to be two thirds of our entire universe. Is that energy? So there's these huge, huge questions that we can't answer. Here. But we do the best we can. So, you know, to answer what's our next thing, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what our next thing is. It, it's exploration, pure exploration. But we do know that we will see things, and we will make more and more precise measurements along the way. The next run that we're doing here, we just started something called Run Three of the LHC, it's going to run for four years, and we're going to have collisions that give us even more collisions per second than ever before, we call that a higher luminosity. We will have much, much more data. We're having much, much more data. We can, we can put our measurements to higher precision, and that's extremely important. When we're done with that, we're going to tear everything out here. All the inners are going to come out. All those nice tracking chambers that Muhammad described is going to come out of there. We're going to put a whole new tracking chamber inside because we're going to have even more collisions per second, even higher luminosity, so much so that we're calling it high luminosity LHC. And then we will have even more data. That's really, really important if you want to make precise measurements and if you want to discover new physics. Do you have a prediction for what, what could be the next thing coming out? Do you have something that... that you're willing to gamble? <laughs> I think we will have an indirect uh, observations mm -hmm. that lead to new physics. For example, we can study the production of WZ poses. We call it the electronic sector because those are the force carriers of the weak interaction. Mm -hmm. And my guess, my personal guess, we will find deviation from the prediction. Okay. And that will lead us later to maybe direct observations. Okay, okay. That, yeah, that's, that, that's happened sometimes in the past. 
we finished up a run, made a little bump, a little deviation from what you expected. And we were very excited. We thought maybe the next time when we turn out, we're going to find something. And then it goes away with statistics because that's, that's the nature of our work. It's always statistical, right? We don't know what happens inside here collision by collision, but we could accumulate the data, we plot the statistics, we make histograms, and we look for anomalies. I, I, I agree that we'll probably have some subtle deviation that we don't understand, and that will be great. And I hope it's a big deviation, actually. I hope we see something that really differs from what we expect. <clears throat> and then we'll be lost for a while, much like we were when we didn't find the ether at the beginning of previous century. Uh, and we needed somebody like an Einstein to tell us, there's no ether. I have a better solution for you relatively to Hopefully we'll see something like that. But we really, really don't know. It's just impossible to predict. And there was a question, I, there's a few other questions I should get to. One is, um, would a bigger LHC do more? We are looking into that. We spent 10 years, well actually, so we spent two years studying all the different possibilities out there. What is the physics we want to look for? how to optimize different types of detectors and accelerators. There are several plans out there. One of them is like an LHC that's much, much larger, uh, up to, say, 91 kilometers around. This is only 27, which is quite a bit. Um, other ideas are linear colliders to produce lots and lots of Higgs bosons. Another idea is to collide muons. Uh, and that's still, there's a lot of interest in that. It's a very, very difficult thing to do because muons live a very short time, but it is something that's being looked into. So there's a lot of different ideas out there. We don't know exactly what we're going to. And there's research on completely different types of colliders as well, uh, using using light and to be able to bring, carry a wave and carry particles on waves that can accelerate to very high energies very quickly. Give us maybe an accelerator that works on a tabletop. There's a lot of different ideas. So it's great to have those ideas. I hope there's some young students who are watching and that they will come here with their ideas as well, because we always need those, uh, both for the accelerators and for the detectors. And speaking of that, it's one other question that came out here. How does someone come to work at CERN? Yeah. It depends if you want to be a physicist or an engineer. Mm -hmm. CERN as an organization employs mostly engineers. Uh -huh. So if you have a degree in engineering or IT, and you are a citizen of one of the member states, you can apply for a job and come to school. Mm -hmm. Now, physicists have different path. for example, they have to study physics, yeah. and then um, do master degree and PhD uh, degree in particle physics, join a university, a member of CERN experiments, and then most likely will end at CERN. Mm -hmm. However, I mean, I said, having said that, they can, uh, apply when they are bachelor students and come for two or three months to CERN as summer students. Uh -huh. uh, every year CERN accepts 300 students in summer. They get lectures during the day, uh, nice project afternoon, and they are young, they have parties during the night. Yeah, there's just many, many ways. In fact, Muhammad and I are the most typical uh, because we're what's called users. So CERN itself only hires uh, about 2,500 people, roughly, plus some contractors, maybe 3,000 in total, who work for CERN. They get a paycheck from CERN, and they work for CERN. Whereas there's 11 or 12,000 of us users. Must be like 5,000 Mohammeds and 5,000 Steves, and then a few others. Um, we're users. A user simply means we come from an institute uh, that is signed on to a memorandum of understanding with one of the experiments. And so we have the right to come here and use the accelerator, and use the experiment, and contribute. So we contribute, we do work on various aspects of the experiment. People are specialists, some are specialists in hardware, some are specialists in analysis, some in software, some do education and outreach. There's a huge, huge range of the different expertise that are used. There are people who come here just to work on computing or, or eventually become experts in computing they can change the field and become competing engineers. Um, many, many engineers come over here as well, as you said, and technicians. So there's a lot of different ways. You can find out more, CERN's homepage has a jobs page attached to it. And Atlas itself also has jobs. If you are 
already in a university and you're interested in getting one of our jobs, come to the atlas.cern homepage and you can find our listings for jobs, which we do periodically. Uh, look at look at those listings to see if there's anything for us. Uh, it's it's a it's great to be in academia, but you are almost always looking for a job. And that's okay because it's hard to call this a job. This is just pure fun. We're doing what humanity does. Uh, we're coming here and exploring our universe, and so you never feel like you're working here, right? It feels like uh, we're exploring, and, and that's what's great about it. Should we do another walk? we we'll walk there? Okay, and I'll look for more questions. I see lots of comments coming in. Thank you. What are we most excited about? Um, that we're going to come on. This is this is the end of our shutdown, our year-end technical stop, and soon they're going to start circulating beans. Do you want to go upstairs at all? This thing's okay. We're going to go upstairs. If you guys want to... Oh, they do. They say yes. Thumbs up. Okay, we're going to go upstairs. It'll get louder, but I think there's a lot of really cool stuff to see up here. You see a lot of the services of the detector. Tubes, which I don't even know what's inside. Electronics. Uh, passage for, for uh, gases as well. Uh, you can see all these cables. Every cable was put in here by somebody. That's what's impressive. Is it's such an amazing human endeavor uh, to build something like this. Let's go all the way up to six. Because at six, we can walk around uh, all the way through to the other side. And you can see more up here. So right there, that, that level four where you're looking at, that's the level of the LHC. So now we're going to go up slightly above the Large Hadron Collider. We can't quite get inside. I tell you, it's a lot of fun when we do clean up. I enjoy getting down on my hands and knees and cleaning up because you get to be up close and personal with your experiment. You see parts you never usually get to see. So we're going to go down here. I hope you guys enjoy seeing all the tubes and cables and things. I think that's one of the coolest things about the experiment. We're not too fast for you, are we, Captain? We have LGBTQ cables here. Mm -hmm. Diversity actually is a very, very important part of different cultures, different social backgrounds. And because of that, we're stronger. Our physics is stronger. We have people who have different ideas, uh, different ways to look at things, different ways to do uh, their analysis. They come up with different ideas. And it helps us to check to make sure that what we're doing uh, is solid. That's a wonderful view, isn't it? So we are 12 meters above the ground floor. Oh, more than that. So, so it's right No, it's. 13 meters from the floor there. To the LHC? Yeah, to the LHC. Mm -hmm. So we're probably closer to almost 20 meters up. Well, if you jump, I can turn you. You can see exactly how high we are. So what do you guys think? Do you like the view here? These, these tubes, we already explained to you. Over here, you can see our... Tra Actually, this is something that's rather important. You have to have different types of detectors to do different things, right? We already explained how they, they measure different particles. But there's also something that are called trigger chambers. So you have, as I mentioned, every 25 nanoseconds, 40 million times a second, you have these 100 billion protons against 100 billion. Finally, you get 60 that collide. But most of the time, they go, they go right through each other. It's not interesting at all. They just go, as you said, elastic collision boring. We want deeply inelastic collisions. That means that they interacted with each other and produced something new. So how many times of those collisions, uh, when, when the protons go through each other, approximately how many times does that have to happen before we get something interesting? 
per second these days we record around thousand bunch of chromosome. We call it a collagen. Uh-huh. What we mean it's a bunch of chromosome. Thousand per second, which means we delete ninety nine point nine nine five percent of the data. Of them. Okay. So we, we we throw away uh, most of these because it's just protons going through protons. And it's not when the, the, the gluons or the quarks actually interact with each other. But these trigger chambers that you see over here, <coughs> they let you know that something's gone through. If a muon comes through, you probably decide you want to keep that. A muon usually indicates that something interesting happened. That tells you that you should look in these precision chambers here. You should take the data that passed at that specific time, and that has nanosecond precision. Whatever passed through at that specific time is probably interesting. Keep that information throughout the other stuff. Uh, and that's what we do here. So that the, these are trigger chambers. Inside there are trigger chambers. Uh, inside uh, where there's, the, there's also triggers set up using the usual detectors as well, and the calorimetry to measure if there's a certain amount of energy over a threshold. So we have a whole variety, a whole menu of different types of physics processes that we look for. And we decide that, hey, this is something that could be interesting, including, for example, Higgs. Like this, this event looks like it could possibly be Higgs. There's many levels. There's actually three levels of decision making, right? There's the one that happens in the electronics here at the beginning, made by these chambers like the TGCs that we see here, the thin gap chambers. Um, they make a very quick decision. Then we reconstruct the data. And from the first reconstruction, which is done very quickly, we also can make decisions. We can cut down and reduce our data until we finally get to something uh, which we can handle. I mean, by handling, what I mean is when we're having the collisions there, the, the, the 100 billion against 100 billion, you're getting a rate that's, that's hundreds of terabytes per second that's coming out. So you have to reduce that. Right? We have to reduce that. Uh, so how many megabytes should we get coming out per second? Per second, um, each collagen needs one to two megabytes on the hard disk. So if you multiply it by 1,000, it's around two gigabytes we record. That we record. Second. Okay, so we're but recording. We uh, run Atlas in average 10 hours a day, six months a year, mm -hmm. and we end with 20 petabytes. Yes, at the so very end of the year. We write it on DVDs, it's like five kilometers. So your laptop, which has a terabyte, you need 20,000 of these laptops to 20 hold. Million, uh, million. 20 million. Oh, sorry. Oh, terabytes. Oh, terabytes. terabytes 20,000 yes. 20, laptops can hold one year of our, of our data. Um, yeah, so it's had enough processing power to go through it. So more, I will look for more questions. You, you talk to these guys, tell them more about the trigger, and I will find out. So trigger, there are, we cannot keep uh, every collision because we have limited computing power. So we have to filter. We have to select the most interesting collisions and delete the rest. And it's done by the trigger system. Level one, which is done by the hardware. And level two, we have a cluster of computers, more than 40,000 CPU cores to make the, or to reconstruct the collisions and look for signatures. And there are many things with, I mean, there are many signatures we trigger, uh, we use to trigger the events. For example, the existence of a photon. So when we collide the protons, do we have as a product a photon or, for example, an electron or a muon or tau lepton or b quark or maybe missing energy? Now, missing energy is interesting because energy is conserved. It cannot be missing. But if we produce neutrinos or weakly interacting particles, those particles will escape the detection and we cannot find them. So we will have energy momentum imbalance equal uh, initial energy will not be equal to the final energy. So if we have missing energy, we know that we produce uh, uh, weakly interacting particles. Now, as I said, we have uh, photon signature, electrons, uh, muons, we have uh, sometimes jets, uh, quarks, we have B quarks, mm -hmm. missing energy. We have long list of uh, particles or signatures we look for in order to save or delete, uh, delete the collision. Mm -hmm. And over time, we develop new algorithms because physicists come with new interesting ideas. And sometimes we cannot use the data to look for that signature because the trigger it's, it kills it. So we have yeah. to update the trigger list all the time. 
and also improve it because sometimes, I mean, we have, we don't have the uh, ideal algorithms and by mistake, we delete interesting collisions we and sometimes we uh, keep <coughs> non-interesting collisions. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, one good example of this would be long-lived particles that we weren't looking for that, that actually uh, come out into the detector further than you'd expect before they transform into other particles. So looking for a vertex that formed maybe in the calorimeter instead of inside the tracking detectors in the very center, it, it came out a ways before it formed other particles. So we had to make adjustments in order to look for that. Um, one of the questions that was brought up here is, is that a lot of good questions, but one is about how mathematicians, kind of rule the mathematicians play. Can, you know, can a mathematician be involved in this? In a sense, yes, but usually not so directly. So we have, uh, in general, there's, a, there's, there's two groups of people. There's the heroes, the experimentalists, right? The ones doing all the hard work. There's these other people who we like a lot, though, the theorists. Uh, there's much, far fewer theorists, um, but they, they look at, at the results that we publish. You know, we publish, as I said, more than a thousand papers giving our results. They might look through that and say, hey, I see some sort of pattern or, you know, this differs from the previous model. This could be explained by this, this, and this. Uh, they, they work very, very hard making mathematically consistent models. When they're coming up with models, uh, they can refer to mathematicians, they can ask mathematicians uh, at their institutes. Many of them are at the home institutes. Some of them are here at CERN to try to find out, you know, if there's a mathematics that can help them out. Mostly, you don't really have mathematicians who are here at CERN. You have theorists. Who are here at CERN. You have these statisticians. Yeah, statisticians. You, you need to know. We all. Physicists tend to be, try to become experts in many different areas, and one of them is in statistics. So we do invite partnerships with people who are experts in statistics, and we try to learn ourselves, because statistics is extremely important. As we mentioned, we do not know what happens collision by collision. Uh, this, this guy, Heisenberg, won't let us see. <laughs> the rule is we're not allowed to see it in that short of a time to know exactly what happened. But we see what goes in, we know what comes out, and statistically, we try to interpret what's going on there. Uh, another uh, important question that came up was about when do we start up again? Uh, and they asked, uh, somebody also asked us in the context of virtual visits. I should say, in, in, in terms of virtual visits, we're always in business, right? Muhammad's always there. We have around 130 visits per year, which no, means two or three visits per week, in yeah. average. And Muhammad's doing a lot of them. I like to do them. We have a variety of us who can speak in different languages, too. So ask, you can request. And we have a form via our web page. So if you go to atlas.cern, go to the bottom is the easiest way you can get to the visits link. You can click on visits, and then you can book a virtual visit with us. And we accept if there are more than 10. So it's a classroom. We really want to talk to classrooms. Um, and uh, we don't have to have the LHC on to do a virtual visit. Now, the LHC will be coming on again very shortly. That's why we've, everything is closed up here pretty much. Uh, the shielding is back in place. The detectors are back in place. This is essentially the final configuration. And uh, this may be our last chance to be down here. It's great. So thank you for having us come down here for you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see all of this. Uh, and they will st start slowly. You do beam tests. You see that the beam works well. Everything has to be done very, very carefully and slowly. Um, we do different scans called Vandermeer scans. We do a whole lot of different tests with the beams before we get into the final collisions. We expect collisions uh, sometime around Easter, I think is what the prediction is for now. And then we'll start up with our physics program, which is at the high energy collisions. And we're ready for that. We really want a lot of data this year. We expect a lot of data, a lot of high quality data. Atlas has some new detectors in there, like our new small wheel for the muon system. And uh, we've made a lot of updates to various components of the detector, so we're ready to go. So, any last things that you want to say to everybody? Nice to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to receive your virtual visit requests. Yes, yes, absolutely. We want to do those. I mean, we offer different languages, our visits in different languages, Arabic, French, uh -huh. German, Swedish. We can do, we can Italian, do. French, mostly in English. 
So I just want to conclude by thanking everyone for coming to join us. It's always a pleasure to talk about science. Remember, regardless of what you see on the web, forget what you see on the web, social media. We didn't invent social media. We invented the World Wide Web so we could communicate the truth, science to you. So remember that. Uh, and, uh, and, and it doesn't matter what age you are to love science. Uh, if you're retired, follow us, please. It's important because we need people who will select uh, our, our world leaders who support science, okay? Please do that. Science is very important to us. If you're a kid watching this, we hope that you're going to be over here soon working with us. We're going to have new accelerators. In fact, if you're a child watching this, your grandchildren, okay, will probably be working on the next generation of accelerators, okay? So it's a long-term plan, a lot of work to do here. So thank you again. And See you again later.